So let's have a final review look <clears throat> at the entire production report and all three parts uh, sort of sequentially presented here, sort of abstractly. I'm not going to give any um, specific example of numbers. But part one of the production schedule is what's called the quantity schedule and equivalent units. Here, we're really concerned with just units. No dollar signs enter the picture in part one. So the quantity schedule and equivalent units, and there are two uh, broad categories of, uh, of, of units that we're looking at. First category is units to be accounted for. And our second category is units accounted for as follows. So that's fairly easy to remember. When we get to part two and part three, we're going to find that it's dollars to be accounted for. And part three is dollars accounted for as follows. So if you can remember that, that the production schedule has uh, sort of four subheadings. Units to be accounted for, followed by units accounted for as follows, followed by dollars to be accounted for, followed by dollars accounted for as follows. So units to be accounted for as follows, work in process, beginning count, and the units started in production that month. We have to account for those units, and there'll be a total. And we account for them by, if we have that many units that we started with and that many units we added, they must have gone somewhere. Well, they did. We transferred some units, so units transferred. What wasn't transferred must be in work in process ending inventory. So the quantity schedule is just this. We haven't looked at equivalent units so far. Remember, this is the quantity schedule and equivalent units. It always helps to just do the quantity schedule first. Just go all the way down on the quantity schedule. These two numbers must equal each other. They must equal each other. So, the units to be accounted for must equal the units accounted for as follows. This whole column here is called the quantity schedule. That's it. That's the quantity schedule. That's it. That's really easy to do. Now we're going to look at our equivalent units. And the equivalent units, uh, we only have to calculate for the units accounted for as follows, the bottom part of this quantity schedule. So we'll write on the side here equivalent units. And we have to have a, a, a column heading for every cost that we track. So materials, labor, and, and uh, overhead, or uh, what we'll call uh, um, uh, conversion. If we combine labor and overhead together, there'll only be a conversion cost. So materials, labor, and overhead. <clears throat> so units transferred, let's say we transferred A units. Well, that means in terms of material and labor and overhead, A units were transferred because if they were transferred, they were all 100% done. So we just put the same number under each category. For work in process ending count, uh, if it's B, there'll be some percentage of it that's done in terms of materials, some percentage of it that's done in terms of labor, and some percentage of it done in terms of overhead. We just multiply that percentage by the units left, uh, the, the, impar the partially completed units, B, and then we total A plus B. So we'll get C, D, and E, and we'll see how we use C, D, and E when we get to part two. <clears throat> So, I've left at the top of the screen here the lower portion of the of part one of our production schedule. So, let's do part two. Part two is cost per equivalent unit. Remember, part one was our quantity schedule and equivalent units, and we use nothing but numbers, no dollar signs there. Here, we're looking at cost per equivalent unit. Now that we've calculated our equivalent units, C, D, and E, we want to know what the cost per equivalent unit is. So this starts with costs to be accounted for. Remember part one started with units to be accounted for. This starts with costs to be accounted for. And our costs to be accounted for are is our work in process beginning balance, not beginning count now, we're talking about dollars, beginning balance, and we're typically given the numbers, the dollar signs for overhead, for labor, for materials, and we just add them up, we get a total. To that, we add all the costs that we added during the period. And we're typically, it's typically broken down per materials, labor, and overhead. And we total them up. So we'll get total costs to be accounted for as that number. 
We have total cost of material plus total cost of labor plus total cost of overhead. If we sum all those three, we'll get our total cost. Now, we want, remember this section is called cost per equivalent unit. So now that we have our total costs, here's our equivalent units that we calculated, C, D, and E. I think you can see that our cost per equivalent unit is simply just some division. Our cost per equivalent unit is this dollar sign divided by C, that cost divided by C. This is that total cost divided by D, and this one here is that total cost divided by E. If we add them all together, we will get what's called a whole cost. And that's another column that we add to the uh, cost per equivalent unit right at the very end, and there's only one entry in that column, whole cost. So now we have our cost per equivalent unit. We're ready to do part three. Part two was costs to be accounted for, Part three is costs accounted for as follows, and we call it a cost reconciliation. Part one, quantity schedule equivalent units. Part two, cost per equivalent unit. Part three, cost reconciliation. So costs to be accounted for as follows. The first thing we do is the cost of the units transferred. Why? Because it's the easiest thing to do. Units transferred. We know how many units we transferred. We just multiply that by whole cost. So we know how many units were transferred. We did that in units accounted for as follows. Look at the top of the screen. We see the letter A. That was units to be, that was units transferred. So what did that cost? What's the cost of it? The cost of it is X. And X is calculated by multiplying A, the units to be transferred, by the whole cost. Because they're 100% complete in terms of material, labor, and overhead. So we don't have to multiply each one by the, the total units by material cost per unit and labor cost per unit and overhead cost per unit. We could just use whole cost. But that's not the case for work in process ending balance. For work in process ending balance, we must multiply it by uh, the, the equivalent units of materials done multiplied by the cost per material. So it's this number up here multiplied by this calculation down here plus the next one, which is the amount of work in process ending units by the percentage done in labor to get equivalent units, multiplied by the cost per equivalent unit. And again, we do it with overhead, again with overhead here. And once we add all of these three together, uh, it'll give us a work in process ending balance, which we'll simply just refer to as the letter Y. We add our X and Y and we'll get a total cost in our cost reconciliation. And that total cost number must be the same as the cost to be accounted for. And that is the production report.